well, really, if we're going to have a democracy, because democracy depends on the public knowing what's going on in the world, then we need alternate sources of information. And I think real news helps serve that purpose. On Monday morning, Barack Obama made official his choices for his top foreign policy positions, appointing Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State, General James Jones as his National Security Advisor, and keeping Bush appointee Robert Gates as Secretary of Defense. Joining us today to discuss the appointments are Phyllis Bennis from the Institute for Policy Studies and Lawrence Korb, former Assistant Defense Secretary under Ronald Reagan and currently sits as Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress. Both, both are joining us from Washington, D.C. Welcome to both of you. Nice to be with you. Uh, Phyllis, uh, I'll start with you, but before, just to get us kicked off, let me play you a clip from Fox News Sunday. Uh, Bill Kristol, a fairly well-known voice of the neoconservative movement in the United States, here's what he had to say about, uh, he was asked the question, uh, do these appointments tell us something about Barack Obama's foreign policy, and, and does this mean change? And here's what he had to say. Obama is not the change. I mean, Bauer said Obama is the change because we're so used to saying that for the last year. But in what foreign policy area is Obama the change? He's going ahead and increasing the number of troops in Afghanistan, something that's already in course under the Bush administration. He's going to go with the Bush schedule with drawdown in Iraq, not his, the one he proposed during the campaign. He's going to be a strong partner with India. He's going to fight terrorism. He's going to work with NATO. I mean, he's going to increase, I hope he sticks with this, uh, defense spending and the size of the Marines and the Army. There's no, I think he's going to continue Bush's foreign policy, basically, for better and worse. Um, I hope he continues it a little better, actually. It is a little tougher on certain things. But um, with Iran, he's going to, he'll have some token negotiations with Iran, but he'll end up with the same choice Bush would have had in terms of uh, having to perhaps to threaten, certainly, and perhaps use military force to stop the nuclear program. So Obama is not the change. That's the simple answer. And his appointments reflect that. So, Phyllis, uh, is Crystal right? I would say Crystal is not entirely wrong, but he's not entirely right either. What is true is that while Barack Obama campaigned on the claim that he would do things differently, that he campaigned on change, what people heard were those broad notions. They heard him say, I will not only end the war, but I will end the mindset that led us to this war. The symbolism of this team that he has appointed for his foreign policy team, and it's not only Hillary Clinton, is not about change. It's about stability. It's about reassuring the world. I'm not sure that anybody wants reassurance that we're going to continue in the same direction. But it's not completely different than what his actual policies were. On Iraq, for instance, what people heard him say was, I will end the war. What his actual policy said was, I will withdraw combat troops leaving behind tens of thousands of troops for a variety of tasks, including training, including counterinsurgency, including a number of other things. People didn't hear that. What they heard was change and I will end the war. So in fact, his election represented a huge repudiation of the Bush policies. This notion that somehow he was elected to continue the Bush policies is, is specious. It's, it's absolute nonsense. But it is true that his actual policies on Iraq, for instance, were not that different than Hillary Clinton's. There were significant differences on other issues, on, for example, the question of Iran. Hillary Clinton supported the resolution calling for the Bush administration to identify the, uh, the, the Revolutionary Guards in Iran as a terrorist organization. Uh, something that even many in the Bush administration itself didn't even agree with. She ridiculed as, as uh, uh, naive Obama's claim that he would talk at the highest levels to the Iranian regime. But, but Obama actually reversed himself when he spoke at AIPAC. Um, he, actually, he actually reversed himself on the, what you're referring to, the Kyle Lieberman well, Amendment. Because he said, he said in that speech that the uh, Revolutionary Guard had been correctly labeled as terrorist, which it must have did. been a reference to Kyle Lieberman. He did. He all, I mean, it's also true that on many occasions he also said that the military option vis-a-vis -vis Iran should not be taken off the table. So the gap between Obama and Hillary is not huge. It exists, but it's not as huge as people wanted to believe it was. But what's important here, I think, is as much the symbolism as anything else. What he's doing here is sending a symbol to the people of the United States and, crucially, to the people of the world, not only the governments, 
who no doubt would love things to, in many cases, go on as they have. But at the level of people, he's sending a message that real change is not going to happen, at least first, in foreign policy. He's also, of course, setting up a situation where his most important priority, which has to do with the economic crisis and providing a, a serious stimulus package, perhaps as much as $700 billion, the, the only real place to get that money is by cutting the military budget. Well, there's no and suggestion that's going to happen. There's no suggestion that that's so, going to happen. Larry, Larry, what do you make? Phyllis is saying this is sending a message, the wrong message, not a message of not change, but stability and, and a certain amount of continuation. We, we know in the past that uh, Obama has talked about rooting his foreign policy in the traditions of American pragmatic policy, going back to Truman. Um, what do you make of this? This isn't about real change. Well, I think uh, Bill Kristol was right, except he had the wrong Bush. Uh, this is basically going back to the policies of the first President Bush, which was a very realistic uh, policy not being afraid to use military force, but making sure you had international legitimacy for it, not uh, diverting yourself uh, away from your core national uh, security, security interests. So uh, I think that's really uh, where he's going. In fact, you may remember that in the campaign, he <clears throat> basically praised the first President Bush. In fact, somebody asked him one time, he said, well, I support President Bush's policy. And they said, yeah, what? And then he said, yes, it's the first President Bush. So I think it's going back into that, uh, that tradition, and I think Bill Crystal's right, also smarter. With General Jones there, I think the National Security Council system will run better. Whatever you may think about the things that President, this President Bush did, the fact of the matter is it wasn't done in a very logical, coherent way where all the options were laid out, the cost and benefits were weighed. But that's what, that's what Crystal's saying, that this is yeah. going to be a continuation of Bush, only smarter. Well, I'm saying it's the first President Bush, not the second. Now, I will say in the second term of this President Bush, he moved back toward where his father was. He has talked to Iran uh, without preconditions. He's had his uh, number three person in the State Department, you know, talk to him. He said he would never talk to North Korea. He's negotiating in the, uh, the six-party talks. He said he'd never agree to a timetable for withdrawal from Iraq. He has. And, in fact, the agreement that Bush concluded with the Iraqis is even more far-reaching than what Obama was saying. As Phyllis pointed out, he intended to leave some troops in there after he got the combat brigades out. But so far, the status of force agreement said they're all out. Uh, Phyllis, uh, so go ahead. We should just note, just on the question of the SOFA, one of the big mysteries is we have not yet seen the U.S. version of what they say they signed. We've only seen the Iraqi version, which does say all of the troops to be pulled out and the bases to be turned back over to Iraq by the end of 2011. We have not heard one word from the White House about what their definition is of what they signed. So I frankly don't believe it. I think this was a version that was shaped to pass the Iraqi parliament. There's also the question of whether the U.S. will under any administration, will abide by it. We've seen these violations of agreements before. But back, back to the question of the, the appointments, I think that we have to be clear on what the overall message is that is going to be sent out to the world. I'm afraid that the overall message that we're hearing, and it's, I think that Larry is right, this is about going back to the first Bush administration. There's also significant elements of the Clinton administration the instrumentalized version of the United Nations as a tool for what Madeleine Albright called a tool of American foreign policy, those were her words, using that as a way of getting international credibility when it's not really a multilateral decision. But, but, it's really unilateral, but given this credibility. In terms of the promise that Obama made, I mean, would Obama have won this, uh, the, pro the uh, Democratic nomination with this kind of politics? Uh, there was a point in the primaries where he was fighting Edwards and he was the anti-war candidate. Uh, we don't have an anti-war member of the cabinet, far from it, with the uh, continuation of Gates. There's no one to the left of Obama among these people that he, had, uh, that he had brought on board, despite his claim that he wants a wide range of opinions. The only possibility might be Susan Rice, and I think that's a real question, given her commitment to using military intervention as an answer to human rights violations. But there's no one that opposed the war from the beginning, as Obama says he did. So it's a, he, he was elected more than anything else because he said he would end the war. He said he would end the mindset that brought us to the war. This is not a challenge to that mindset. 
So Larry, what do you make of that? This is not a change of mindset. Uh, maybe it's a change of mindset from the first term of this Bush, but it's certainly not a change of mindset from the history of, uh, of American traditional foreign policy, which certainly the progressive section of the Democratic Party thought they were getting. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, the world that, that existed on September 10th that gave us Al-Qaeda, that gave us 9-11, that gave us uh, the, the spiraling uh, out of control in Afghanistan and Pakistan, that world wasn't created by this Bush. This was created by decades of U.S. foreign policy. And, we, and, and certainly people thought with Obama the change of mindset meant something more profound. Are, are we going to get something more profound? Well, again, I think it will depend uh, on two things. One is uh, President-elect Obama said in the uh, news conference today, basically, I'm going to make the policy, I'll listen to them, but I'm going to be the decider, if you will, and they're going to have to, uh, have to carry it out. The other is the immediate actions, not only if he starts a withdrawal from Iraq right away, I think that will be key because he said he wanted to you start, you know, implement it right away, and some of the military commanders are not happy with that. If he does that right away, and the other, if he takes actions like closing down Guantanamo, for example, I think that that will be, you know, very, that will help, you know, improve America's uh, image in the world and undermine the case that a lot of uh, these groups like Al Qaeda make against us. Well, how do you? What do you make of the uh, p uh, continued appointment of Gates? Um, this well, is, where, where the ha where is there any change in continuing the man who's in charge of the military policy? I think basically what he was saying is that given the fact that we're transitioning between Iraq and Afghanistan and, you know, we want to have some, you know, continuity at the top, at least that's what I think he's saying. We don't know how long Gates is going to stay, and I think that's a, an open question. There were press reports that would only be for a year. That wasn't uh, mentioned today. Uh, there was a report on NPR last week that said this is just sort of a elongated transition, and I think that was the feeling. Well, we're in the midst of, you know, some delicate uh, negotiations with the SOFA. Uh, Phyllis, uh, in terms of this change of mindset, one would think, uh, let's say, put it this way, I think the sort of more progressive section of the Democratic Party, and I think a lot of people thought change of mindset meant questioning something about the need for the United States to be the dominant power in the region, uh, in the Middle East, and, and, and even more generally, there was some question about, you know, does the United States have to have a policy based on militarism and hegemony? Uh, well, this this cabinet does not suggest any questioning about any of this. Well, more to the point, we got a, a very direct answer to that question today from Barack Obama himself at his press conference when he said that there is, that we all agree that the United States must lead the world. There was no sense there that it was talking about leadership uh, without the military part being at the front and center. I think what is being lost here, there was an extraordinary moment, and it isn't lost. It still could be reclaimed. It isn't too late for the new Obama administration to say, we need to redefine what security means, to acknowledge there is no such thing as national security. There's only international security. If we're talking, if we're serious about keeping Americans safe, as well as the people of the rest of the world, we have to stop talking about domination. Hello? That we must be the dominant power. That we must be the dominant power. We have to end that discourse and say that if we're serious about keeping the world safe, Americans safe, other people safe, it has to be based on cooperation rather than domination. Ending this notion of, of national security as being rooted first and foremost in, in, in military capacity. Larry, I'm not sure if you heard Phyllis's final words, but let me just say, she sa Phyllis is saying that the fundamental issue is give up the ambition of U.S. dominance and take up the issue of global security, that they're not the same idea. Um, and this, this, she thinks the, uh, there's still an opportunity for this. I, I question whether this cabinet's really ready to question any of the fundamentals of well, U.S. policy. I think uh, two things. One, in Susan Rice's comments today, she's the uh, ambassador to the UN designate. She mentioned, you know, having to restore our relations rip and work with the rest of the world and realize we can't solve these problems ourselves. So I think it's a move in uh, in that direction. The other is that the national intelligence estimate that came out <clears throat> last week basically said it doesn't matter. The age of American hegemony and dominance is over. Uh, because basically of uh, the, the actions particularly of the last eight years. So, in effect, 
it's sort of like Iraq. That issue has already been decided. The Iraqis want us out. We're going to go. Uh, similarly, you know, in terms of American hegemony, American dominance, you can't do it. He did say he wanted to be the strongest military power. You can do that. But national power is not just military power. It's also economic power. And look at our economic situation. Terrible. I mean, people worry about you buy weapons to deal with the Chinese. We're borrowing money from the Chinese. So but that's I, exactly I think the that, that era there, has already was, ended. But, but that's exactly the problem, that the... At this moment when we have lost so much economic clout and all of the diplomatic and cultural and political clout that goes with economic clout, what's left is the military. That's where we are the unchallengeable force in the world. And I'm worried that the drive, that's what hasn't yet changed, the drive towards making the United States the dominant power, if we can't do it through economic and cultural and di diplomatic ways, We'll do it through military. That's the danger here. If we don't completely get rid of that notion of leadership as defined by domination. Larry, did you hear that? I, I heard some of it. And listen, I've got to go here. Okay, well, just to find, you can have the last word, Larry. Okay, I, I think that you basically, uh, as I looked at it today, and, and it was I thought Susan Rice was the one who summed it up, I think, what people wanted for <clears throat> from President-elect Obama, and I hope that that's the policy that he follows and that the other people there will implement that policy. Whatever else you may think about the team, they can get things done, and it's one thing to make policy. It's another thing to make sure it's carried out. All right, thank you very much for thank joining you. us. Donate today and receive a new documentary film available to members of the Real News Network. The History of the National Security State with legendary author Gore Vidal. Bonus features of the DVD include an in-depth response to Vidal from ex-CIA analyst Ray McGovern, who served under seven U.S. presidents, an exclusive interview with Colin Powell's former chief of staff Larry Wilkerson, and an insightful interview with oil policy analyst Antonia Juhas. The news magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Hollywood and Washington, there's a symbiotic relationship. They both deal with illusions. Reality doesn't often uh, play much of a part. I think I saw through the myth of the uh, Cold War almost from the beginning. I was a Washington political kid from a political family. Roosevelt first had radio because he had a, this great speaking voice and everyone liked to hear. Truman proceeded to break every arrangement that Roosevelt had set up for a peaceful coexistence. And Truman thought that it would be a good idea. Why not just stay armed all the time? And then he devised the national security state. You've got to go up and swear allegiance to the United States or else you're a commie. I mean, we, were, we had imported fascism. We get Dwight Eisenhower, who said that we have this great military industrial complex. It is a dangerous thing. And he said, this is going to change everything. And the way our country's governed is going to change us politically. Along comes Jack Kennedy, who wanted to make his mark, believed in the Cold War. But he said, in this kind of politics, it is the appearance of things that matters. I think everybody should take a sober look at the world about us. The national security state still exists, only it isn't communism anymore, it's terrorism. This is the most serious thing that has happened in the history of the United States. Knowledge is power. We need an honest new system. We need the real news. This is the sort of thing we can build right now without anyone else's permission from the government or from the business community. It's the powers in our hands. If we're not going to sleepwalk into more wars, we think we need to start with a television news network that won't bow to pressure and has the courage to seek facts. And that means independent economics. And that's why we need you. Make a tax-deductible donation now of at least $10 a month or a one-time give of at least $75. As a thank you for your support, we will send you the new documentary film, The History of the National Security State.